Here is the fourth video in my series on serial killers and cults. The first three videos on Charles Manson, Jim Jones, and the two crazy women who tried to knock off President Ford were more along the lines of cults. This video is about serial killer Ted Bundy, who murdered 36 women in four, possibly five states. He may have possibly murdered around 100. Ted Bundy was a serial killer who murdered over 30 young women and girls in multiple states during the 1970s. Bundy used his charm to win the trust of his victims. He would approach women in public places and ask for assistance for various tasks, such as loading things into his car or launching his sailboat. He would pretend to be injured with his arm in a sling or leg in a cast. He would also impersonate authority figures, such as police officers. Once tricked into being led away, the women would be attacked and taken elsewhere to be sexually assaulted and killed. Bundy was born in 1946 to 22-year-old single mother Eleanor Louise Cowell. Cowell was sent from her home in Philadelphia to the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont, referred to by the locals as Lizzie Lund's home for naughty ladies. After Bundy's birth, Cal returned home to Philadelphia, where Bundy was passed off as her brother. Later on, Cal took Bundy and moved from Philadelphia to Tacoma, Washington, to avoid the gossip in her working-class Philadelphia neighborhood. There, she moved in with relatives and hoped to start a new life. Elizabeth Louise Cowell became Louise Cowell, and four-year-old Theodore Robert Cowell became Theodore Robert Nelson. Louise joined the local Methodist church, and there she met Johnny Bundy, a cook. They were married, and Ted Nelson became Ted Bundy. Bundy attended the University of Puget Sound and then transferred to the University of Washington, where in the spring of 1967, he met Stephanie Brooks. Their relationship developed over their shared interest in skiing. Stephanie was a few years older than him and sensed that Bundy had no direction in his life, but more concerning to her, she also sensed that he used people. After graduating, she slowly extricated herself from the relationship after she took a job in San Francisco. Bundy continued to write to Stephanie and then tracked her down later on. Seeing the same directionless guy that she knew before, she sent him away. Bundy, despondent over the breakup and directionless, dropped out of the University of Washington. After pulling himself together, he re-enrolled at the University of Washington, majoring in psychology and becoming an honor student. In 1971, he took a job at Seattle's Suicide Hotline Crisis Center, where he met and worked with Ann Rule a former Seattle police officer who would later write The Stranger Beside Me, which is the book I used as a source for this video. Rule never saw anything strange in Bundy's personality, at least at first, and described him as kind, solicitous, and empathetic. During this time, from 1969 to 1974, Bundy was living on the second floor of a rooming house at 4143 12th Avenue in Seattle. At the time, it was known as Rogers Rooming House and was owned by an elderly couple, Ernst and Frieda Rogers. The house still exists, also a fence has been put around it to prevent the curious from trespassing. At this point, Bundy decided he would revamp himself and be the type of guy that Stephanie would want. He went back to the University of Washington, where he proceeded to impress his professors while working a series of part-time jobs to make ends meet. During this time, there was a new love in his life, Meg Anders, a divorcee with a three-year-old child. However, this didn't mean that Stephanie was out of his life. Through 1969 and 1970, Bundy became more educated, more socially adept, 
and even managed to win a commendation from the Seattle Police Department for running down a purse snatcher. He also saved a three-year-old from drowning when the child wandered off and fell into Green Lake. He was molding himself into the perfect citizen. After graduating from the University of Washington, Bundy served as an intern in a psychiatric counseling center while also becoming involved in Republican politics. He began law school at the University of Puget Sound in 1973. During this time, Bundy was leading a double life. He had been dating Meg Anders for four years, leading Meg to believe that there might be marriage in their future. However, recently, he managed to become engaged to his old obsession, Stephanie Brooks, too. In the summer of 1973, he arrived in Sacramento on a business trip for the Republican Party. He looked up Stephanie and took her out to dinner. Stephanie couldn't believe the change in Bundy and was beyond impressed. She visited him in Seattle, where he continued to wine and dine her. Stephanie fell for him like a ton of bricks, and they began to talk marriage. It didn't take long for Ted to do a complete 180. He became distant and finally told Stephanie that it was just not going to work out between them. After chasing after her for six years, he seemed to lose interest. She returned to California in January of 1974, and that was that. She never heard from him again. Was this whole drama an act to get back at Stephanie, to break her heart, and get even for Bundy being rejected by her earlier? Who knows? Bundy started his crime spree in the Seattle area, where he was living in late 1973. The first to disappear was 15-year-old Catherine Devine, who had vanished from Seattle's north side in November of 1973. She had told friends that she was running away after a fight with her boyfriend and was going to hitchhike to Oregon to stay with some cousins. Her body was found in McKinney Park on December the 6th. She had been strangled and sodomized. For 28 years, Kathy was one of the victims connected with Ted Bundy, but in 2001, DNA testing showed that William E. Cosden Jr. was linked to Kathy. Captain Dan Kimball had never closed the Divine case and treated it as a cold case, even after Bundy was executed. On January 4, 1974, 18-year-old Karen Sparks was attacked in her basement apartment near the University of Washington. When her housemates checked on her, they found her unconscious with her face and hair bloody. She had been beaten with a metal rod from the bed and that same rod being jammed into her vagina which split her bladder. By the time her roommates found her, thinking she was still sleeping, 20 hours had already passed. Sparks lay unconscious in the hospital for 10 days and woke up to find her father and her roommate Bob next to her bed. She had no memory of what had happened to her. Sparks ended up with 50% hearing loss and 40% vision loss from the attack. She also suffers from ringing in her head and for a while had epileptic seizures, which over time have abated. In a 2020 interview, Sparks believed that she was saved because her housemate next door talked in his sleep and it chased Bundy away. Over time, with the help of her family, Sparks regained her ability to walk. Karen Sparks is now Karen Sparks Epley, works as an accountant, and has a family of her own. Linda Ann Healy, a senior majoring in psychology at the University of Washington, shared a house with four other students. She worked at Northwest Ski Reports and was up and on her bike to get to work by 5.30 in the morning. She would then go to class and return home. Linda, like Karen Sparks, had a basement room in the house at 5517 12th Avenue in Seattle, only a few blocks north of Ted Bundy's rooming house. On January 31, 1974, Healy vanished from her room leaving blood on her pillowcase. Her blood-stained nightgown was left behind and a pair of jeans, blouse, and boots were missing. Police believed that her abductor had taken the time to dress her before taking her away. 
In March of 1975, two forestry students stumbled across the remains of four women at Taylor Mountain. Using dental records, the lower mandible of a skull was identified as that of Linda Ann Healy. The house still exists and has been repainted from green to brown. In 1989, the main floor was being used as a preschool. 19-year-old Donna Gail Manson was a student at Evergreen College in Olympia, Washington. On March 12, 1974, she set out on foot from her dorm to attend a jazz concert on campus. She never arrived at the concert. Two days before his execution, Ted Bundy confessed to her murder. Her body has never been found. 120 miles from Seattle, on April the 17th, 1974, Central Washington State College freshman Susan Rancourt vanished after attending a dorm advisor meeting. The disappearance of Rancourt caused other women to come forward with reports of seeing a man with his arm in a sling requesting help to carry armloads of books to his car, a Volkswagen bug. This bug would pop up in descriptions several times and would finally be stopped by a cop. In the spring of 1974, Captain Herb Swindler had taken over Seattle's Crimes Against Persons Unit. Now, Swindler was tasked for investigating the mysterious disappearance of all these young women, which seemed to originate in the Seattle area. They might have originated there, but they sure didn't stop there. On May 6, 1974, Oregon State University student Kathy Parks left her dorm to meet friends for coffee at the student union. She was never seen again. Oregon State Police Lieutenant Bill Harris thought she had been abducted and that this event was independent from the Seattle disappearances. She also had some mental health issues as well as some personal problems, and it was thought that she might have just run away. However, Captain Swindler of the Seattle PD thought that the Oregon disappearance was related to the Seattle disappearances. Nine months later, Park's skull was discovered with the bones of some of Bundy's other victims on Taylor Mountain. Lieutenant Harris could be forgiven for believing that the Seattle and OSU cases weren't related, as 26 days after the Kathy Parks disappearance, 22-year-old Brenda Ball vanished from the Seattle suburb of Burien. She set out that day from the Flame Tavern, a bar in Burien. She was seen at the tavern, and after failing to get a ride home from a musician at the bar, she left. She was last seen by witnesses talking to a man with his arm in a sling. Ted Bundy confessed to her murder before he was executed. The Flame Tavern has long been gone and has housed the Fiesta Del Mar Mexican restaurant. The building now sits empty. 18-year-old George Ann Hawkins was a straight-A student at the University of Washington. Hawkins went to a party with a sorority sister, and after that went to visit her boyfriend at his fraternity house. She left after 30 minutes and left by a back door. She was seen by another person in the house who talked to her briefly from a window and watched her walk away until she got about 30 feet from the building. She never made it back to her sorority house, which was only 40 feet away, vanishing without a trace. Before Hawkins disappeared, there were two people who had seen a man with his leg in a cast on crutches, carrying a briefcase in the area. Before Bundy was executed, he gave information as to the location of Hawkins' remains. However, since the identity of the remains can't be confirmed, she is still listed as officially missing. Janice Ott was a 23-year-old probation caseworker at the King County Youth Service Center in Seattle. On July 14th, she rode her 10-speed to Lake Sammamish State Park, east of Seattle, where she planned to spend a few hours relaxing and enjoying the sun. 
A man with his arm in a sling approached her, but this time there were witnesses, two groups of picnickers nearby. They heard him ask her if she could help him put his sailboat in his car since he had a broken arm. They also heard him tell her that his name was Ted. No one ever saw Janice Ott again. On that same day, 18-year-old Denise Nasland arrived at Sammamish Park along with her boyfriend and another couple. Around 4.30, she went to the bathroom and vanished. In both of these disappearances, women at the park had reported a man approaching them with his arm in a sling, asking them to help him put his sailboat in his car, and both had refused. The next day, a massive search of the park was carried out for both women, and Ted had appeared and allowed himself to be seen in broad daylight. Ted might have been seen, but in the end, the only thing law enforcement in multiple jurisdictions had to go on was an average, nondescript-looking guy and a brownish Volkswagen bug of unknown year and any man driving a very common car. The attacks now seem to be escalating. The Sammamish Park abduction count was two in one afternoon. Then, after July 14, 1974, the disappearances in Washington suddenly stopped. Ted Bundy had been attending law school at the University of Puget Sound during 1973 and 74, and by April 1974 had dropped out and had been accepted at the University of Utah School of Law for the following school year. Bundy packed up and leaving girlfriend Meg Anders behind, set out for Salt Lake City during the Labor Day weekend of 1974. He got a job as a night dormitory manager and then moved on to a higher paying job as a campus security guard at the University of Utah. Seattle construction worker Elsie Hammonds stumbled over some bones when eating lunch in Sammamish Park on September the 6th a lower jaw, rib cage, and a spinal column. King County police detectives were notified and roped off the area. The remains were confirmed to be Janice Ott and Denise Nasland, the two women that had disappeared from the park on July 14th. On October 18, 1974, 17-year-old Melissa Smith, daughter of a Midvale, Utah police chief, met a friend at a pizza parlor. Midvale is a town of about 5,000 people south of Salt Lake City. Smith left the pizza place around 10 p.m., but never made it home. Her body was found nine days later at Summit Park in the Wasatch Mountains. She had been beaten with a crowbar, which had left depression fractures on the side of her head. Her body was covered with bruises, and she had been strangled, raped, and sodomized. On November 8, 18-year-old Carol Durant decided to take a shopping trip to a local mall in Murray, Utah. When she was leafing through some books, a man approached her and, claiming to be a police officer, informed her that someone had tried to break into her car. He identified the car and where it was parked, so she accompanied him and identified himself as Officer Roseland. Claiming that he needed a statement from her at the police station, Bundy led her back to what he claimed was his patrol car. Instead, she saw a Volkswagen Beetle. He showed her what seemed to be a badge, so she got in the car. When the car began driving in the wrong direction, she attempted to get out of the car. That's when he cuffed her. When the car stopped, she kicked the door open, kicked him, and ran. She was picked up by a couple that were driving by. They took her to the Murray Police Station. Of course, there was no Officer Roseland. Later on, she would confront Bundy in court at his trial for aggravated kidnapping. She later earned a degree in business management and has worked in the telecommunications industry. An avid golfer, she has one son, Levi. The same night that Carol DeRanche was attacked, 17-year-old Debbie Kent was attending a high school play, The Redhead, at Beaumont High School in Bountiful, Utah, with her parents. 
The play ran longer than expected, so she volunteered to pick up her younger brother at the roller skating rink. Her brother waited at the rink, but she never showed up. Kent's parents checked the high school parking lot, but their car was still there. Residents of an apartment complex across from the high school had heard screams, but upon checking, they found nothing. Debbie Kent had vanished. Bundy had been busy casing the high school auditorium, asking various students, including the drama teacher, to go outside with him. At one point, he pretended to be a theater usher. He even watched the play, sitting directly behind the Kent family until intermission. Bundy later confessed that he didn't kill Debbie Kent at the high school, but took her to his apartment, where he later killed her and kept her body for about 24 hours. He identified the place where he dumped her body. Unfortunately, only a few of the bones were ever found, and it wasn't until DNA tests in 2015 that confirmed that only one bone, a kneecap, belonged to Kent. On Halloween night, 17-year-old Laura Aim disappeared a few miles from Lehigh, Utah. On Thanksgiving Day, some hikers stumbled upon her body in the Wasatch Mountains on a riverbank when they were hiking through American Fork Canyon. She died of multiple blows to the head and was strangled with a nylon stocking. She was also raped. Needless to say, Ted Bundy wasn't doing well at the University of Utah. He had a C average and two incompletes. He was also drinking more and more. Because of his attempted abduction of Carol DeRanche, he was listed in the police database, but so were a thousand other guys, and he had no adult criminal record. Twenty-three-year-old Karen Campbell, a registered nurse, was vacationing with her fiancé in Aspen, Colorado. They were in the lounge at the Wildwood Inn when Campbell left to retrieve a magazine from her room. The last time she was seen was when she got off the elevator and was walking down the hall to her room. When Campbell didn't return, her fiancé went up to the room looking for her and found the room undisturbed. It was obvious that she had never made it back to the room. Aspen police searched the hotel but found nothing. One month later, on February 18, 1975, a recreational employee noticing a bunch of birds stumbled upon Campbell's body on the side of Owl Creek Road, a few miles from the Wildwood Inn. On March 15, 1975, 26-year-old Julie Cunningham disappeared from Vail, Colorado, after she left her apartment in the neighborhood of Apollo Park to meet a friend at a local tavern for drinks. She never arrived at the tavern. Before he was executed, Bundy confessed to her murder. He said that he lured her to his vehicle by posing as an injured skier on crutches and asking her to help carry his ski boots. He said he knocked her unconscious, drove her to a remote area about 80 miles west of Vail, and raped her. Then he strangled her and disposed of her body in a shallow grave near Rifle, Colorado. Her body has never been found. 25-year-old Denise Oliverson disappeared from Grand Junction, Colorado after leaving her home following a fight with her husband. She was heading for her parents' home on her bike to cool off, but never arrived. Later, her bike and sandals were found by a railroad employee under a viaduct a block from her home. Just minutes before his 1989 execution, Bundy confessed to murdering Oliverson and throwing her body in the Colorado River. Two other girls would disappear from Colorado during the spring of 1975. Then, as in Utah, the Colorado disappearances suddenly stopped. Back in the Seattle area, the melting of the snow started with the coming of spring. On March 1, 1975, two Green River Community College students were working on a forestry survey project on Taylor Mountain and came upon a human skull. This would turn out to be the skull of Brenda Ball, the woman who had disappeared from the Flame Tavern 30 miles away in Burien back in June of 1974. After a police search of the area on March 3rd, 
Another skull was discovered and was identified as that of Susan Rancourt. She disappeared from Ellensburg, 87 miles away, on April 17, 1974. It was becoming obvious that this was some sort of a graveyard for the skulls of the victims. Another skull, that of Oregon State University student Roberta Kathleen Parks, who had been missing since May of 1974, was also found, 262 miles away from where she had disappeared. All three skulls had been fractured with a blunt instrument. The skull of the first woman that vanished, Linda Ann Healy, was also found on Taylor Mountain. On August 16, 1974, Sergeant Bob Hayward of the Utah Highway Patrol saw a light-colored Volkswagen Beetle driving around his neighborhood. As he knew everyone in his neighborhood and knew that no one owned a car of this type, he became suspicious. When he tried to pull the car over, the Volkswagen shut off its lights and sped away. Hayward was able to pull the car over finally. The driver, Ted Bundy, claimed that he was lost. Hayward asked to look in Bundy's car, and Bundy gave his consent. Hayward found a crowbar, a pair of handcuffs, a ski mask, an ice pick, a flashlight, torn strips of sheets, a mask made out of pantyhose, and some rope and wire, indicative of burglary tools. Hayward placed Bundy under arrest for evading a police officer. He was later released on his personal recognizance. This was the first arrest for Ted Bundy. Detective Jerry Thompson was looking over the arrest records for the day, and the name Ted Bundy rang a bell. He realized that this fit the description of the man that tried to abduct Carol Duranch at a shopping mall back in December, identifying himself as Officer Roseland. Also, he had been arrested in Granger, Utah, only a few miles from Midvale, where Melissa Smith had last been seen alive. On August 21st, Bundy was arrested on additional charges of possession of burglary tools. The police in Salt Lake City felt that they had their man, and the attempted abduction of Carol DeRanch and the disappearances of Melissa Smith, Debbie Kent, and Laura Ain. With the help of a friend, Bundy lawyered up and retained the services of criminal defense attorney John O'Connell, at which point Bundy stopped communicating with the police. Bundy was released from jail, but surveillance units still tailed him, while the Salt Lake City Police proceeded to interview friends and family, including girlfriend Meg Anders. On October 2, 1975, Ted Bundy was arrested in Salt Lake City and charged with aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault. His bail was set at $100,000. He then became a suspect in a longer list of unsolved homicides in several states, and detectives in Utah, Washington, and Colorado were anxious to know everything there was to know about him. They were interested in what his girlfriend Meg Anders knew about him. Any sense of privacy she may have desired was pretty much over. And by the fall of 1975, there were over a dozen detectives in Washington, Utah, and Colorado working on the Ted Bundy case. Bundy still had people on his side, his parents, which you would expect, his cousin Alan Scott that he grew up with in Tacoma, his girlfriend, although doubts were starting to creep into her mind, and Frida Rogers, who had been his landlady for five years. On November 20th, Bundy was freed on bail, which was raised by his parents. He then returned to Seattle, but that didn't mean he didn't have interactions with the police. Seattle police kept Bundy under surveillance, and he seemed to take delight in losing them. It became a game to him. In 1976, Bundy returned to Salt Lake City to stand trial for the kidnapping of Carol Duranch. On Monday, February 23, 1976, Bundy's trial started, and he elected to forego a jury trial leaving his fate up to Judge Stuart Hansen. Judge Hansen found Bundy guilty of aggravated kidnapping with sentencing set for March 22nd. Judge Hansen ended up delaying sentencing for 90 days to allow for a psychological evaluation of Bundy. 
This would take place at the Utah State Prison at Point of the Mountain, while at the same time Colorado was moving rapidly with her own investigation. The investigation into the Aspen, Colorado murder of Carolyn Campbell was taking on an increased head of steam with the processing evidence with Bundy's Volkswagen bug and a timeline of credit card slips that were from cards that had been stolen. On October 22, 1976, Bundy was charged with the murder of Karen Campbell in Pitkin County, Colorado. This was almost a year after he was charged in the Carol Durange murder in Utah. Bundy wasn't one to sit around and let all this just happen to him. On October 19, Bundy, after not returning to his cell, was discovered hiding behind a bush and had what amounted to an escape kit. It contained a Social Security card, driver's license, road maps, and notes on airplane schedules. This development got him placed in solitary confinement. On January 28, 1977, his psychological testing complete, Ted Bundy was taken by car from Utah State Prison and brought to Aspen, Colorado. He was put in the Pitkin County Jail, awaiting trial for the Karen Campbell murder. Judge George H. Lohr would be presiding in the case. The preliminary hearing started on April 4th, and afterward, Judge Lohr remanded Bundy for trial, and he decided to defend himself. He would be transferred from the Pitkin County Jail to the Garfield County Jail in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. The trial date was set for November 14, 1977. That trial would never happen. Bundy had managed to get permission to do research for his own defense. On the morning of June 7th, he was transported to the Pitkin County Courthouse for his trial and while waiting, was doing law research in the stacks. A woman standing outside the courthouse was surprised to see a man jump from a window and run off. She went inside the courthouse and asked if men jumping from windows was a normal occurrence. Bundy had escaped, leaving Pitkin County law enforcement red-faced. Bundy found a Cadillac with the key still in it and drove off, staying low in the seat to avoid being identified. Early in the morning of June 13th, patrol officers were drawn to a Cadillac that was swerving all over the road and, thinking it was a drunk driver, pulled it over. All Bundy could do was smile at the cops. He had been nabbed after being free for six days. So now, to compound his problems, Bundy was charged with burglary, escape, misdemeanor theft, and felony theft. Now, on his daily trips to the law library, Bundy was wearing handcuffs and leg irons. But after all that, Bundy managed to convince his guards to remove the cuffs and the leg irons. Go figure. Bundy didn't intend to stay around for his trial, as he had another escape planned. He did it this time by finding an opening under the ceiling light in his cell. He found he could crawl through the opening after removing the light fixture and crawl through the ceiling until he reached jailer Bob Morrison's apartment. After practicing the route and the timing, he traveled through the crawl space, dropped down through the Morrison's apartment, changed clothes, and walked out the door. Shades of Shawshank Redemption. He stole a car, drove out of Glenwood Springs, and made it to Vail, where he caught a bus to Denver. Taking a cab to the Denver airport, he flew to Chicago. When Bundy's jailer brought him lunch the next day, he found that the person sleeping under the covers was actually Bundy's law books and legal papers. Bundy had a 17-hour head start on the Garfield police, and while roadblocks were being set up, Bundy was on a train traveling from Chicago to Ann Arbor. He left Ann Arbor, Michigan in a stolen car on his way to Tallahassee, Florida. Arriving in Tallahassee, Bundy moved into an apartment called The Oak near Florida State University under the alias of Chris Hagen. It was January 8, 1978. He survived by theft to get items for his new apartment and stolen credit cards for meals as he proceeded to create his new identity with stolen ID numbers from Florida State Records. The Chi Omega House was, and still is, a sorority house in Tallahassee, a college home for Florida State University co-eds. 
On January 14, 1978, Bundy would strike again. At 3 a.m., one of the residents of the Chi Omega house, Nita Neary, returned home from a date and found the back door open. When she went inside, she heard a thump and running footsteps. Then she saw a slender man wearing a dark jacket and a knit cap. In his right hand, he held a club. Before she could move, he dashed out the door. Thinking that they had been robbed, she ran up the stairs and woke her roommate, Nancy Dowdy, and the women searched downstairs, finding nothing missing. They then went back upstairs to find Karen Chandler staggering out of her room with blood streaming from her head. They entered the room and found Karen's roommate, Kathy Kleiner, also bleeding from the head. Dowdy called 911. The first law enforcement officer on the scene was Tallahassee police officer Oscar Brannon, thinking he was answering a call to break up a fight between two women over a guy. He was to find out differently. Brannon was followed by Tallahassee officer Henry Newkirk, Florida State officers Ray Crew and Bill Taylor, and paramedics Don Allen, Amelia Roberts, Lee Finney, and Gary Matthews. While the paramedics worked on Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner, the police searched the rest of the house. Ray Crew entered room four and found Lisa Levy, apparently asleep on her side, until he saw the blood stain on her sheets. He called for the paramedics, and they worked on her. But when she was transported to the hospital, she was pronounced dead on arrival. Officer Newkirk, entering room nine, found Margaret Bowman lying on her face with blood splattered all over the walls. Investigators believe that Bundy attacked Lisa Levy first, then Margaret Bowman, and then waited in Bowman's room for the rest of his victims to come home. Roommates Chandler and Kleiner might have been killed were it not for Bundy tripping over a trunk in the room waking up Kleiner. She was still injured badly from blows to the face. The noise woke up her roommate Chandler, who was beaten in the face before headlights of a car shining through the window scared Bundy off. He ran right past Chai Omega resident Nita Neary and out the front door. Twenty-year-old Lisa Levy from St. Petersburg, Florida, had worked all day at her part-time job and after returning to the sorority house, decided she wanted to go out. She and friend Melanie Nelson went out to a campus disco. Remember, this is the 70s. Sherrod's, which was next door to the Chi Omega house. They arrived around 10 p.m. Tired from working all day, she only stayed for 30 minutes and went back to the Chi Omega house and then went to bed. She was alone in her room, number four, since her roommate had gone home for the weekend. Bundy snuck into Levy's room and bludgeoned her with the head of an oak log. An autopsy showed that she had also been strangled. Her right nipple had almost been bitten off. In addition, there was a double bite mark on her right buttock, leaving four rows of marks. Her left collarbone had been broken by a tremendous blow. A pile of logs was found in the back of the house and it appeared that Bundy had grabbed his weapon of choice on the way in. Lisa had been sexually assaulted both rectally and vaginally with a Clairol hair mist bottle containing a nozzle top. The night of January 14, 1978, 21-year-old Margaret Bowman was going out on a date at about 9.30. When Margaret arrived at home, she waited for her friends to return so she could talk to them about her date. Afterwards, Margaret returned to her room to get ready for bed. It was 2.35 a.m., the last time Margaret was seen alive. Later on, when police arrived, they found Bowman lying on her face. Her skull had been shattered so badly that Henry Newkirk, one of the police officers, said that he could see into her skull. The autopsy showed that the blows to Bowman's head were so vicious that parts of her skull were driven into her brain. She had been strangled with pantyhose. There was no evidence of sexual assault. Kathy Kleiner lived in room 8 of the Chi Omega house. 
The night that she was attacked, she had gone to a wedding with her fiancé and then out to dinner with some friends. Both she and her roommate, Karen Chandler, were in bed by midnight. After Bundy woke her up by tripping over a trunk in their room, all Kleiner remembers is Bundy standing over her with a club, bringing it down onto her face. Kleiner's jaw was broken in three places, and there was only one hinge that was still attached. Several of her teeth were broken, and her jaw was wired shut for three months. Kleiner spent a week in the hospital recovering from her injuries. Afterwards, she left Florida State and moved to Miami to be closer to her family, and later got married. That marriage later ended in divorce. She later said that no relationship in her life would have lasted at that point, and she needed to heal first. Today, she has remarried and has children. Karen Chandler lived in room 8 in the Chi Omega house and went to her parents' house on the night of January 14, 1978, to cook dinner for them. She returned before midnight to work on a sewing project in her room and then went to bed. She awoke because of the noise, which turned out to be Bundy attacking her roommate, Kathy Kleiner. Before she could react, Bundy turned on her. Almost every bone in Chandler's face was broken, and she also suffered a broken arm as well as a broken jaw, broken finger, and a concussion. After being taken to the hospital, she was placed in the intensive care unit. Chandler said that she could barely recognize herself in the mirror while recovering in the hospital. She spent a week in the hospital and took the rest of the academic quarter off and later returned to Florida State, moving back into the Chi Omega house. She is now married and has children. The police at Chi Omega House might have thought their night was over, but they would be wrong. The house at 421 Dunwoody Street was a vintage duplex located on the edge of the Florida State campus, eight blocks from the Chi Omega House. Two residents of the house, Debbie Ciccarelli and Nancy Young, heard banging noises and called the police. They reached the Tallahassee Police Dispatch at 4.35 a.m. After only a few minutes, they were stunned to see a dozen squad cars. When the police arrived, they entered the apartment of 21-year-old Cheryl Thomas, a Florida State dance major. They found her lying across her bed. Blood was on the bed and all over the floor. There was a pair of pantyhose that had been fashioned into a mask. Paramedics Charles Norvell and Gary Matthews, who had treated Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler, got the call to return to the Florida State campus to treat Cheryl Thomas. Thomas was transported to the hospital. Thomas' skull was fractured in five places. She had a dislocated shoulder, and her jaw was broken in three places, damaging the eighth cranial nerve, which caused permanent hearing loss in one ear and affecting her balance. Any dreams she had of a dance career were over. After she got out of the hospital, Thomas left Florida State and went on to earn a bachelor's degree in dance and a master's in deaf education. She taught ballet and worked with the deaf. It seemed that Bundy, after being scared off from the Chi Omega house, had run directly to the Dunwoody Street duplex to engage in another assault. It was almost like he knew who was inside. As for 431 Dunwoody Street, the property no longer exists, which shouldn't be too surprising, as 46 years have gone by. As for Bundy, he continued to live at the Oak, living off stolen credit cards. There was one small problem, though. He couldn't come up with the 320 bucks for his rent. Halfway between Jacksonville and Tallahassee sits Lake City, Florida. 12-year-old Kimberly Leach lived there and attended Lake City Junior High. Kimberly, discovering that she had left her purse in her home room, left class and went back to get it. This necessitated her walking between buildings. She disappeared without a trace, turning up eight weeks later. However, Bundy was seen by two people who were able to give the police sketch artist a description. They were also able to pick Ted Bundy out of a stack of mugshots. 
It was February 10, 1978, and Ted Bundy still didn't have the $320 he needed for his rent at the Oak and didn't see any way to get it. So the plan was to jump the rent and leave Tallahassee. On the evening of February the 11th, he treated himself to one last meal as Chez Pierre with his stolen credit cards at the Adams Street Mall. The next day, he gathered all the belongings from his apartment he could carry, wiped down his room of fingerprints, and left. He spotted a Volkswagen Beetle with the key still in it, and changing the plates, left Tallahassee in the rearview mirror and headed west. David Lee, a patrolman in Pensacola, Florida, spotted an orange Volkswagen Beetle coming out of an alley near Oscar Warner's restaurant at 10 p.m. and called for a plate check. The plates came back as stolen. Patrolman Lee turned on his lights, causing Bundy to make a run for it. Finally, Bundy pulled over and Lee ordered him out of the car. After a struggle, Bundy was arrested and put in Lee's patrol car. Bundy's response was, I wish you had killed me. Lee had no idea who he had just arrested. Pensacola reporters soon informed local law enforcement that they needed to check the FBI files where they would find that they had just arrested a man suspected of 36 murders. Bundy was the prime suspect in the murders at Dunwoody Street, the Chi Omega House, and the abduction of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, but all the police had him on was auto theft, credit card fraud, and forgery. Unlike Colorado, who allowed Bundy to escape run under their noses, law enforcement in Pensacola weren't going to take any chances. Whenever he left his cell, he was in handcuffs, chains, and a leg brace that went from his ankle to his thigh. Bundy was transported from Pensacola back to Tallahassee, and during the first week of March 1978, he appeared before Judge Paul Rudd. On April the 7th, searchers finally found the remains of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach at Sewanee State Park. Dental records confirmed her identity. On April 27th, a warrant was issued for dental impressions to match the bite marks on Lisa Levy's body. On July 27th, Bundy was indicted for the murder of Lisa Levy, the assault of Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner, and the attempted murder of Cheryl Thomas. On July 31st, another indictment was handed down for the murder of Kimberly Leach. There would be two murder trials, and these trials wouldn't start until mid-1979. Larry Simpson would be the chief prosecutor in the Chi Omega trial, and the presiding judge would be Edward D. Coart. The hearings were set to start on May 21, 1979. Judge Coart granted a change of venue to Miami because of the difficulty of selecting jurors who were even remotely impartial. Bundy was housed in the Dade County Metro Justice Center Jail. Stations from Colorado, Utah, Washington, and Florida were present to cover the trial. On July 7, 1979, the trial began with opening statements from Prosecutor Larry Simpson. During the trial, Bundy's defense was not going great as he had trouble hanging on to his attorneys as two of them quit and he ended up handling his own defense. The prosecution had 49 witnesses. On July 23, 1979, the jury took less than six hours to find Ted Bundy guilty of the murder of Chi Omega House residents Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman. He was sentenced to death in Florida's electric chair known as Old Sparky. Bundy's trial for the Kimberly Leach murder began on January 7, 1980, in Orange County, Florida, with Judge Wallace Jopling presiding. This time, Louise and Johnny Bundy didn't attend, but Carol Ann Boone, the woman that he would marry on February 6, 1980, would stand by him during the trial, believing in his innocence. Ted Bundy was found guilty of the murder of Kimberly Leach, and on February 12, 1980, he was sentenced to die in the electric chair. He was then taken by helicopter back to Rayford Prison to sit on death row. 
after multiple appeals, a decade on death row, and four death warrants signed by the Florida governor, Bundy was finally executed by electric chair at Florida State Prison in Rayford on January 24, 1989. He was 42 years old. His final words were, I'd like you to give my love to my family and friends. The tab for the state of Florida for all these appeals ended up being $6 million. After years of appeals, Ted Bundy was finally executed. A white hearse took his body from the prison with the crowds outside cheering and yelling, Burn, Bundy, burn. Bob Keppel, the Seattle law enforcement officer that was part of the Ted Bundy investigation at the beginning, was finally able to interview him before he died, and after 14 years of denying that he had murdered anyone, he finally came clean to multiple murders. He also gave information as to where he had dumped the bodies. He had buried some of them, left some in the woods, and dumped some of them in the river. Keppel was shocked with what he heard. He was looking into a mind of a man born to kill. Bundy had confessed to 36 murders, but Keppel believed it may have been around 100. Author Anne Rule believed he may have started killing when he was a teenager. Detectives in Washington, Oregon, Colorado, as well as Idaho, began looking at their cold case files of missing young women to see if any of them might have been connected to Bundy. Keppel, needing more time with Bundy before he was to be executed, contacted victim's advocate Linda Barker to see if she could get the surviving victims and the families of the deceased permission to delay the execution. They pretty much told Barker to go pound sand. Ted Bundy's parents, Johnny and Louise, didn't attend the last trial, nor did they visit him the day before he died, although Bundy did talk to Louise on the phone. Bundy's wife, Carol Ann Boone, had stopped visiting him, even on the day before his execution. Carol Ann left Florida for Everett, Washington, and never came back. However, his stepson, Jamie Boone, a Methodist minister, visited Bundy before he died. So finally, after a string of murders that terrorized people in multiple states, the Ted Bundy saga finally came to an end with his Florida execution in 1989. The next video in my 1970s Serial Killers and Cult series is about the Zodiac Killer. Make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you know when that video drops.